disgraceful performance. All right, Celeste, thanks. Andy, you're on the air. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, um, I too, am a graduate of St. John's College in Annapolis, and I, I, I wanted to say that um, the problems that you, that you talk about, the, the difficulty of getting kids to think for themselves, are problems that have been there since the very beginning of education. And, it's, and um, you're right that a variety of educational approaches can be proper. Um, I want to point out, though, that uh, you seem to think that uh, the uh, the problems with texts and, and educational approaches are largely due to special interest groups inside the education system, and I disagree. You look at history books that have been watered down because of conservative special interest groups uh, and, and liberal interest groups warring against each other to the point where the books have absolutely no substance at all. Yeah. You want to give you want to give primary source education to students, you want them to read the Federalist Papers, they have to have the money to buy those books. And it goes back to the problem of the bureaucracy sucking up all the money again. Uh, you know, it's I, I don't think the Federalist Papers cost any more than some of the textbooks that I've seen, mm -hmm. which have no content. Well, the thing is that by the time you get to the point of buying all the primary sources you need to, to balance that textbook or to give that textbook some sense uh, or to actually contradict... Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, by the time you're done buying all the stuff you need, I mean, it's, you know, St. John's it isn't cheap because, I mean, all those primary books do cost a bit. You have a wonderful bookshelf, but it ain't cheap. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. But I, I think when, when, you, when, you, when you think of all the things that schools manage to spend their money on, I suspect there would be no problem whatever to spend money on, on things of higher quality. Even if you stuck stuck to a textbook, which I don't think is the best education, mm -hmm. you could have better quality textbooks. Yeah. I mean, I, I saw recently a textbook that my niece is using in the... Uh, uh, tenth grade, and I looked through it and decided at the end that it was only toward the end of the book that they got to the kind of math that you would normally expect in the ninth grade. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, and so, so a better book would not have cost any more. It's just mm -hmm. that they're, 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 they're selling junk. Well, do you think one, one part of the answer is, for, is, is to uh, ensure that pu public school systems offer a variety of educational approaches? So, you know, I mean, so you can have choice within the public system. I mean, here in Arlington County, for instance, uh, it's very successful. You have alternative schools and people are lining up to get in. Well, you see, if if you have uh, uh, the, the, the political muscle to do that, fine. But I think if you have parental choice, uh, then the schools will adjust to what the parents want. Very often you have uh, backlogs of parents trying to get into traditional schools, and the other schools don't change at all because they know they have a monopoly. All right, Andy, thanks for your call. Chad, you're on the air. Uh, yes. Um Good morning, Diane. Good morning. Um, I'd like to call to say that I agree with a point that you were making earlier, and I think that one of the problems with the public school system, while it's not without its own blame, is the lack of parental involvement. You speak of school choice, but when you have a parent who's concerned enough to put their child in a private school, that says something about the parent's involvement in the children's education. But if you have parents that are completely uninvolved in what the children does, expect the school to do it completely by themselves, then you have a problem. I know when I was coming up in school, if I got in trouble, I had to answer to my parents, and that mm -hmm. was serious punishment. But if you have children that are not in that environment, they're going to continue to be disruptive. Children are no longer allowed to they're very restricted in how they can discipline students. Students mm -hmm. are carrying weapons to school. And I'm not saying that this is universal, but these are serious problems. And for you to just write them off and say that they're not as serious or that that's always been the case, I think is a very broad misrepresentation. It's well, I think that's a little, that's a little bit, that's a little bit uh, strong. Uh, the fact is that suburban middle-class schools and quiet neighborhoods have had their standards going down. The fact is that SAT scores at Yale have been going down. And I agree with uh, and so I this is all over the whole society, and you can't say say that this is because of one kind. The, the, the parents of most of the immigrant uh, generation, for example, never set foot in the school. All they did was send their kids there and say, do what the teacher says. I'm not there's, there, believe me, there's enough blame to go around, but I think that the schools try to shirk their share of the blame uh, by saying it's the parents. Because when, when, when quality education appears, the, that's where the parents line up. I've seen cases where the parents show up the night before and, and stay overnight as if it's lining up for tickets for a rock concert or something to try to get their kids into a decent school that is teaching them something rather than the junk. Carlene, you're on the air. Hello. <laughs> Yes, go right ahead. Good morning, morning. Diane and Dr. Soul. It's, this is a very stimulating discussion and a very refreshing uh, perspective. Uh, I myself have a graduate degree and uh, went, I actually got it in the UK because I felt that American graduate schools are run rather like businesses and they were too expensive and most of the professors are off doing book tours and things in foreign countries and careful, aren't, in, careful. aren't in the classroom. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I've also gone to school in Africa and, and in France. Uh, so I, I feel, while I'm not a specialist, you know, I, I've had some different perspectives. 
My question is, um, has to do with a friend who recently went back to George Mason University. She wants to be a teacher in the public high schools. And uh, I, being interested, I looked at some of her class notes and a, a book that she's using, and uh, it has to do with the methodology of teaching in the public schools. And it's something like a you know, blueprint for multi-diversity cultural education or something. And the book is, is teaching teachers how to teach, but the whole thing the book is about is how America's made up of all these different groups and how teachers have to be sensitive to all these different groups. And, and uh, it had all these songs, like from Amish people. And, and, uh, okay. and, I, and I, excuse me, but I, I started, I started <clears throat> thinking to myself, well, this methodology obviously is reflecting what the, cha- the demographic changes in America and also reflecting the culture war in America. And, um, and I see personally that America is, is starting to become a kind of social Lebanon where all these different groups are trying to get sort of a piece of yes. action. And I thought to myself, and my fr- I said to my friend, I tried to talk to her about this, and her biggest worry about her next exam was if she was going to have to memorize the national holidays of 15 different countries hmm. so that she can be sensitive to her students. And I'm thinking, you know, hmm. Dr. Soul, what does this have to do with education? Is the school supposed to be a agent of socialization in, in America, or is it, I mean, I, I just don't understand sure. that. Sure. Well, well, interesting well, point, Carlene. Go ahead, Dr. So. Tragically, this is the view of the education establishment, that that is what the school is supposed to be doing. Uh, what's so ironic is the school is failing so miserably in what they are paid to do that they should take on this role of being social philosophers. And when you think of the pitiful academic background of the people who are taking on this kind of job, you also wonder what can be going through their minds at all. Uh, It's not true that we're we're becoming a multicultural nation for the first time. Uh, This country had people who were speaking umpteen different languages, probably to a greater degree 70 or 80 years ago than today. Because you had vast numbers of people. I, I know people today uh, who are professors and whatnot who say, you know, we never spoke English in my home, you know, but they went on anyway. Uh, and they became bilingual, not because they were bilingual programs, but because their parents spoke one thing at the home and they spoke something else at the schools. But you know as well as I do, you can't turn the clock back. I mean, we seem to have moved to a different place in the society in terms of its expectations, in terms of what it will tolerate and not tolerate. There is a push towards recognition of all of these various groups within that make That's, up our society. So so what do you do? You can't well, no, just no, say no, I'm I, not no, 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 I'm sorry. I can't agree with any of that. Uh, it is not society that is forcing these people to do this. These people have been looking for ways of evading academic work for generations. Who is they? When the you say- teachers, the administrators, they love anything that is non-academic. Uh, if you, there have been studies done of kids in uh, uh, schools and departments of education. They love anything that's non-academic when you get into role-playing and all this kind of thing. And I think it's perfectly understandable. You get the dregs of the academic world becoming teachers. You have education courses that repel able students from ever studying the subject. And so you've cut them off at the pass. Anyone who has any ability does not want to take these ridiculous courses in college. And of the few who are are hardy souls who go on and and take it and suffer through them and become teachers, those with high ability are the first ones to drop out. And so within a very few years out of the class, you have the bottom half of the class now has tenure, and the top half is going somewhere else. Support for programming on WAMU is provided by the public relations firm of Barksdale, Ballard & Company in recognition of WAMU's contribution to the Washington Washington metropolitan area and its pursuit of excellence in public broadcasting. Good morning, Nancy. You're on the air. Oh, hi. Uh, Dr. Sowell, it's such a privilege to talk to you. I've read uh, your work. Uh, you have great common sense. I agree with everything you say this morning. I could give examples to uh, back you up, but I'd like to give two examples, uh, recent examples, that um, that would contradict something of what you say as far as what's going on in the schools. Uh, we have a situation uh, in in our school, or we had when my daughter was attending local high school, of uh, a lot of uh, black children who were not achieving were goading and uh, criticizing and making life miserable for their fellow uh, black students yeah. who were achieving. 
that that's a problem that the, the educational system is not really responsible for. Oh, absolutely, and and, and it, it's a national problem, and it's an absolute disgrace. It's pitiful. I asked my neighbor who was black how she uh, uh, coped with this with her own two very bright uh, daughters, and she said she told them exactly what her mother told her in the face of discrimination by whites. She said, you are two individuals. You will go as far as you can work to go. And that's how, and they are achieving. Now, the other thing is recently in um, Alexandria, uh, they, they, well, evidently they had an honors program. Well, there was a black pressure group which uh, has actually uh, made the honors program uh, be disbanded. Um, I, I believe they have been successful in that because there weren't enough blacks in the honors program and to me they're they're cutting off their nose to spite their face i mean absolutely they are they are uh abolishing an avenue of achievement which they could attain oh I, absolutely and i think that the, the uh, m much of the so-called black leadership bears a terrible responsibility for pushing these kinds of ideas on these kids that they, that they have no chance and that everything is rigged against them and so on of all the questions that i've answered after giving lectures around the country the one that really hit me the hardest was asked by a young black man at marquette university he said uh, even though i'm graduating from marquette very soon what hope is there for me <laughs> And I thought, my God, there's twice as much hope for you as for your father and ten times as much as for your grandfather. But you, you know, you handicapped yourself so much that you may not be able to make, take advantage of the opportunities that are actually there. Nancy, thanks for your call. And let's go to West Virginia. Richard, sorry to keep you waiting. No problem. Go right ahead, sir. Two questions. Uh, the first is that if our education, and I'm more or less of your generation, and if our education was so great, and we're so smart, how is it that we've let our schools deteriorate to the point that they have? You know, we're in charge now. Well, when, and I don't know who we uh, are. I think, I think that... This generation I'm talking about. Well, but you see, the problem is uh, decisions are not made by generations. They're made by organized groups. And teachers have been a very organized group since the, since the 1960s. And the National Education Association is all in favor of these crazy things that have been criticized here this morning by me and by others. Uh, so that uh, they have, and in fact, that's what choice is all about, is it about putting the parents and the taxpayers and the general public in charge and not allowing these little groups to create their own little fiefdoms where they do what they please regardless of what the rest of us think. And you're saying that these people who were so well-educated are so uh, narrow-minded in their uh, thinking that they still are willing to jeopardize the school for their own personal gain. Of course. Well, then Professors do that at the, at the colleges across the country. Well, then I, I still think that there is something missing in the education of someone who is um, who can make a choice like that so easily. But but the second point is, um, you know, you're connecting a lot of things that have happened at the same time, and you're connecting connecting them as if they're cause and effect. And you know, we could just as easily make the argument um, that it's high budget deficits that make the uh, educational system bad, and say that as our budget deficits have been increased, our education has deteriorated. And no, that's actually not true. It's not, not true that, that as the deficits uh, ballooned during the 1980s, there, there was a minor uh, upturn in the, in the educational things. You know, you can say anything, but they won't necessarily accord with the facts. But what I'm saying is that I, I'm saying that about what you're saying. The fact that you have linked these things together um, and that they have happened more or less at the same time, and you can't say that, that because some, that there's a direct um, link from something that's happening in society this year to the education that year. These things have... A I have not said that. I have not said that. I, I have not said that. Uh, I've what, said what I'm saying is... Hold on, Richard. Let him, uh, okay. let him respond. Okay. I have not said that. I've traced a lot of these things over a long period of time, and I've used a lot of cross-checking of one set of information with another set of information. That's how I arrived, for example, at the conclusion that the money has very little effect. I've checked spending internationally. I've checked spending from state to state. I've checked spending over time. I've checked spending as a percentage of the gross national product. No matter how you look at it, the money has no effect. <laughs> and a caller in Upper Marlboro. Bob, you're on the air. Yes, Diane. Uh, good morning, and I'm very pleased that you accepted my call. I'm a great admirer of Dr. Sowell. I've known about him for a long time, and I, I heartily agree with virtually everything he ever writes or produces. And I would like to relay a quick story, not that he needs any, but I'd like to, <laughs> I'd like to relay one that will back up just about everything he's saying. All right, sir. And real quick, 
my background so you'll know I was not born with a silver spoon in my mouth. My grandmother was illiterate. My mother, who came to this country as a teenager on a cattle boat, had a third grade education. I'm a very proud graduate of Georgetown University and earned every cent of that education on my own. However, the story. I was in the school system of Prince George's County. My background is that of an investigator. And after retiring, I went into the school system to investigate crime. Now, there are a lot of people who don't like to hear something like that, but crime does exist in the schools. Everything that happens on the streets happens in the schools. Believe me, it does. All right. And there was a young girl in the 12th grade at a very prominent, I won't name the school, I'd be happy if pressed to do so, but very prominent public high school in Prince George's County who literally could not read. She was in the 12th grade. Her favorite subject, get this, was driver's ed. She saw driver's ed as being her way to succeed in the world. She didn't attend a single class all day long, but never failed to attend driver's ed. And I pointed out to someone someday that a terrible, terrible thing had been accomplished here because no one had given any thought to the fact that this little girl was going to have to take a written driver's test yeah. and her knowledge of English was nil. Yes, I, I yes. I relay that... that to show some of what's going on in sure. this bit about money being needed. That's garbage. I, I have done some teaching in my time on a law enforcement level. You give me a group of people who want to learn something, and I guarantee you I'll teach them quickly, and the way to do it is with discipline. All right, Bob, thanks for your call. Dr. Sowell, any comment? Oh, well, that, that's absolutely the, the, the case. Uh, when I was growing up, we had no guards in the public schools. I was 42 years old before I saw a public school guard. And yet today we have national conventions of public school guards. So the deterioration is there. But a lot of it, too, is the whole permissive notion. And again, the people in the education establishment are all for the permissiveness. Uh, at the very least, you can sort out the violent students from the other students. They don't seem to want to do that. Are you being listened to or are you simply being dismissed as part of a conservative effort to try to change the system, uh, deal with... They don't seem to want to do that. Are you being listened to or are you simply being dismissed as part of a conservative effort to try to change the system, uh, deal with the fact that teachers do have the kind of control they do, administrators have the kind of control they do. How are you being regarded? Well, uh, not, not nearly as well as I would like to be, but I'm sure that's true of everybody. Uh, but I think that a lot of people have to fight a lot of battles on a lot of different fronts at the same time for, for, for a victory to ever come. And that's true in a war. It's true in all kinds of uh, things. Uh, just think how long it took for the civil rights movement to achieve some of its goals. How many people we'll ne we've never heard of went out there and sacrificed in order that they could do that? On almost every other movement in the history of the country has taken that. But it does make you wonder, um, considering how far down American students have gone yes. and how concerned people are about the education system, whether somebody is not finally going to say, maybe Seoul has a point. Well, it's not a question of whether I have a point. There are great numbers of other people out there fighting in different ways, and somehow or other, the t grand total of all that may have some impact. This broadcast of the Diane Ream Show is made possible in part by the Old Forest Bookshop, offering used and out-of-print books for varying tastes. Specializing in literature, history, and art, the Old Forest is located a half block off Wisconsin Avenue at 3145 Dumbarton Street in Georgetown. And Bobby, you're on the air. Yes, hello. Um, at a time when we look for integrity in our leaders, one of the things that distresses me most as a parent of three children in school who are taking a pretty challenging um, course load and uh, is the amount of cheating that goes on. 
What do you think about it, and what would you do? Um, I'll just hang up and listen. All right. Thanks, Bobby. Well, the data indicate that the amount of teaching has also gone up tremendously uh, over the years. And again, another sign of the moral degeneration. Uh, what has to be done about it is that you have to make it uh, more of a, uh, more, you have to, that the student has more to lose by cheating than to gain. And again, many people in education are not prepared to do that. But that's part of the whole disciplinary issue, isn't it? That's right. But a lot of, but a lot of that is within the control of the schools. For example, the, the you know. At, at, mo at many schools, and probably most schools, a professor who discovers a student cheating, really, if he, if he himself simply flunks a student, that's probably all, the most he can do. Because if he brings a charge, it's going to be so due processed, you know, that you're going to be devoting yourself to this one case for untold months uh, with people looking for an out some way all, all along. But there are others who might say, well, if you flunk that child, you may put an end to at least a half-hearted attempt to stay in school. Well, that, that's that's a lovely thought. Uh, again, <laughs> there are no, there are no, there are, you know, there are no free lunches. Uh, and if there are people out there who suffer some bad consequences from their own actions, that will not, that will certainly, at the very least, uh, give other people something to think about. Uh, I can remember when I was in college, there was a young pl a playboy quite wealthy, uh, who led, led a qu quite good life and didn't have enough time for his academics. And uh, one Friday he came home and there was a note from the administration that said, uh, Dear Mr. X, uh, uh, please uh, ha remove your belongings from the room over the weekend as we have assigned another student there Monday morning, yours truly. And uh, my roommate and I had planned to have some play some ping pong that evening, but we stayed home and, uh, and, and, and did some study. What a signal. <laughs> and Anthony, you're on the air. Oh, good morning. Dan. Morning. So it's, it's really a pleasure, and I'm a little nervous, so I'll have uh, two quick questions, and then I'd like to hang up and listen. All right, sir. I recently finished a very good book by Rush Limbaugh called The Way Things Ought to Be. And in that book, he has a chapter on education, and one of them was uh, like a cultural demonstration at Stanford attended by a I think it was Jesse Jackson, where the, the slogan was, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western culture's got to go. And when I read that, it, it had me thinking about the whole issue of political correctness on campus, like uh, condom distributions and uh, books in New York City that have Heather has two mommies and things like that. My question is really, uh, what do you think, uh, Dr. Sowell, about the, the issue of PC on, uh, in schools, especially this, the junior schools? And uh, the second one is, uh, if, if school choice does not come through with the new Democratic administration, what do you think about homeschooling? And I'll hang up and listen. All right, sir. Thanks. Homeschooling is a, is a, is a desperate expedient. Um, uh, I would have thought I would have thought it would be quite rare, and yet uh, as time goes on, I have acquired more and more respect for people who homeschool their children rather than to send them into the junk that's out there in the public schools. And the numbers are growing. The, the numbers are growing. Uh, I've run into people who homeschool their kids, uh, and I wish that I could have uh, could have done that. Hmm. And what about his earlier point on PC in schools? Oh, well, Stanford, of course. I mean, the uh, people who wanted Western civilization to go are uh, getting their wish at Stanford. Well, but what's your own reaction? I think it's I think it's insanity. There's no way, uh, you know, we live in Western civilization. That's why you ought to study it. Now, if you have time left over to study other things, fine. But to talk about why do we study Western civilization rather than other civilizations, you might as well ask why do we study the Earth but instead of other planets and other galaxies? But don't you as an African-American believe that in some way perhaps some of your own heritage has been left out of that kind of uh, study of uh, purely Western civilization? I, I really wonder how many people here can trace back their ancestry to a particular part of Africa, which is itself one of the most multicultural uh, areas of the world. Uh, and and, and if, even if I could tell where my ancestors came from, uh, it would probably be radically different from the way it is 300 miles away from that particular spot. But doesn't that and so the you, question? And, no, but the point is, you have the 24-hour day, and so there are no free lunches. And if, and if you're, you're going to try to spread the students even thinner than they are and pretend to study these civilizations, because in order to study them, you have to have scholars who've done the scholarship and the work. I mean, you can't conjure these things up out of thin air because Jesse Jackson is chanting. And it's going to take you... See, I, I've, I've spent 10 years writing a book on race and culture, which is not, not it's still in manuscript. And so I know that if you're going to do this seriously and responsibly, you cannot do it overnight. And if you're going to have not simply me, but what you really need dozens of people doing this all around, you're talking about something somewhere in the middle of the 21st century. But if you're going to have these little, uh, little tidbits of nonsense 
carefully selected, uh, uh, tendentiously selected in most cases, then of course you're not talking about education, you're talking about propaganda. But Dr. So, go back to what you said earlier about the small steps uh, that had to have been taken during the civil rights movement in order to achieve what has been achieved now. Can't the same be applied? So I, I am all for people taking those small steps to learn these things in the, in, in the, in the proposed graduate schools for scholars to study these things so they'll know what they're talking about. And so they won't be selling Kwanzaa as some kind of African uh, 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 tradition when, in fact, it originated in Los Angeles. 885-8850. Shan, you're on the air. Hi, yes. I was driving in my car and, unfortunately, don't have a car phone, but I took exceptions to something um, that was discussed regarding that um, being offered these touchy-feely classes. Um, I am not in that 25% learning style that is pure academic. I'm a very bright person, but I do not do well in an academic setting. Um, I think that adding some of these touchy-feely and interactive classes, I mean, I got through a chemistry class because I had an a instructor who saw that, you know, the book was hard for me, so the lab part was the part I could excel in. I think this is very important to, you know, not all of us are book learners. Well, you know, uh, I, I could say that I also have a high opinion of myself, and, I, and I'm, not, I'm not very good at dancing, but I really don't think that ballet schools should be adjusted to take to, uh, for people like me. People like me shouldn't be in ballet. Uh, and the school has, and, the, and the, you have to realize, too, that uh, it's not a question of what you like or what you're good at. There are requirements in the world that if you're going to build bridges across the river, you have to know a certain amount of math if you don't want those cars to, to fall into the river as the, as the bridge collapses under them. Uh, and if you want doctors who can cure people, you're going to have, pe have to have people who know chemistry, whether they like it or not. So we don't have the option of just doing whatever happens to feel good to us. Diane, you're on the air. Um, hello, Dr. Saul. You have a very interesting uh, program. Um, however, I find myself um, almost emotional because of the way um, you seem to approach. I, I, th my question is this. What about the children um, from the dysfunctional families who don't have a recourse? I'm talking about the young minds who can't make decisions as to whether they have a place to study or, or as to whether they uh, can go on uh, to uh, learn to read because they don't have the help at home. Uh, can you address that issue? Absolutely. That, that is a tragic situation regardless of how the education system is running. But what you've said tells me absolutely nothing about why the present mess is better for that child any more than it's better for any other child in more fortunate circumstances. 885-8850, and let's take a call from Arlington. Ed, you're on the air. Hello, Diane. Hi there. Dr. Saul, I appreciate what you have to say. I myself am a graduate of a Jesuit high school in uh, Milwaukee, a graduate of Georgetown University, and I teach in a local Jesuit high school here in D.C., and uh, I'm of the view that it's possible to uh, focus on academics and make sure that students are learning how to learn, but also outside of the classroom, uh, as in our retreat program at Gonzaga, which is where I teach, to uh, have the kids come in touch with uh, themselves and their values as people. And we also require that students do 40 hours of community service where they also come in contact with people of different backgrounds. But that isn't at the expense of uh, de-emphasizing uh, academics. Well, uh, do you have a longer than 24-hour day at that high school? Well, the thing is, we are stretched pretty thin. We do, uh, we do really push pretty hard to, uh, to do all of that. But we manage to do it, and, you know, I think I'm correct in saying we're probably one of the better high schools in the area. Do you have some concerns about community service programs, Dr. Schell? Yes, uh, because what is a service and a disservice depends on the person who's looking at it. Many of the things that are called community services, I consider a great community disservice. Uh, if you look at the Stanford, on the Stanford campus, we have a uh, bicycle shop that I think performs a community service. And next door to it is the community service building, which I think does an incredible amount of mischief in the world. So uh, the notion that some little group of elites will decide what is a service and a disservice, and that they will then uh, force uh, and cajole other people into doing those kinds of things, uh, strikes me as an abuse of authority. Well, we're a private school, sir, and the, uh, the students who attend our school do so at choice, or their parents' choice, fine, so to speak. Fine. And uh, they're aware of the, of the service requirement when they do it. Uh, they do things like tutor kids from a local housing project, or some Corda, which is right next door. Mm -hmm. They work in soup kitchens. Um, and 
along with that, since it is a, a Jesuit Catholic school, we have uh, theology classes mm-hmm. and uh, social justice where we'll study uh, justice theories of people like John Rawls, and we'll go back. Well, I, I must, I must, I must tell you in all honesty, I really do not see high school students studying John Rawls. Well, I think the not- graduate students at Harvard might study John Rawls, but I think I, I just really wonder if people aren't kidding themselves uh, and getting these kids to get into something like John Rawls. Doctor Sell, is the uh, situation going to get even worse before it starts getting better? Absolutely. Uh, I see no sign that the, certainly the present administration, uh, if if they do introduce choice into the public schools, that will be a step in the right direction. And maybe some later administration can then extend it further. But uh, they are so in hoc to the National Education Association that nothing will be done that will disturb the people down at the NEA. Dr. Thomas Sowell of the Hoover Institution, his new book is called Inside American Education, The Decline, The Deception the dogmas. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much. And if you'd like a cassette copy of today's program, call us for information on 885-1030.